Well, there's a lot to say about shamanism, so I'll try to sort of limit it. Um, first of all, uh, I actually talk about this in my book, The Science of Enlightenment. Um, the notion that you can look upon consciousness as sort of like a three-layered parfait, and you have surface ordinary objectified experience that might be called conventional reality. Then you have the absolute rest and the formless doing that is at the very, quote, center, if we wanted to use that metaphor. It's not perfectly good, but if you imagine it's a sphere and there's this surface, and then there's what's in the center, which is the dharmakaya, it's formless. Then there's all these <clears throat> intermediate realms. And if we think of uh, the spiritual path as a journey from surface to source, some people are going to traverse those intermediate realms without any unusual phenomena at all. They're just going to go right down. Some people are going to encounter um, the pool of poison and pain and trauma and uh, such big time, um, which is sort of the, uh, the Freudian subconscious. Some people are going to encounter the Jungian su subconscious, gods, ghosts, ancestors, healing abilities, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the spirit world, basically what native people would refer to as the spirit world. Some people encounter both the Jungian and the Freudian version of the subconscious. As I say, some people encounter neither. Uh, they just go right down. So the, um, there can be a couple extremes with regards to this map of the journey. One is not uncommon, you start, so you're on the surface, and the journey is not turning 180 degrees away from the world. It's actually turning orthogonal. It's turning 90 degrees into an independent dimension, which is the dimension of depth as opposed to surface. So now you're going down, of course, each level has its own surface, right? So one extreme is you go down a little bit and you encounter either the Freudian subconscious or the Jungian subconscious. Um, and if it's the Freudian, you just don't want to go there. If it's the pleasant side of the Jungian, well, that's one thing, but if it's sort of weird and scary, archetypal material, you don't want to go there. So you flail your way back to the surface like a drowning person gasping for air. I'm never going to go down there again because uh, that's just too weird. That's one extreme. Another extreme, which is the extreme I recommend, is you just keep going down no matter what. Keep a plumb line, a direct vector towards the source. Um, St. John of the, I mean, the, it's not just me, the, the Christian tradition says the same thing, although they, they think of it as going up <laughs> rather than down, but it, it doesn't matter. I mean, the, the direction of the coordinates is, uh, grid is, uh, doesn't make any difference at all. So St. John of the Cross uh, drew this picture of this mountain um, Mount Carmel, which actually exists in the Holy Land. It's near the city of Haifa in northern Israel. Cho and I visited there. It's pretty cool. Uh, it's the origin of the Carmelite order, which was one of the main meditating orders uh, back in the day. Anyway, he drew Mount Carmel, um, and he talked about Subida del Monte Carmelo, the ascent of Mount Carmel. Um, and in this metaphor, God or the source is not, uh, you know, at, uh, at the source, it's actually sort of <laughs> at the pinnacle, but it's exactly the same thing. Um, and uh, on it he writes, nada, 
nada, nada. Y en monte nada. This is how you're going to get there. Nothing, nothing, nothing. And when you finally get to the peak of the mountain, nothing with a big capital M. And then he's, he shows these like wild monsters and flowers and things. And he says, if you want to ascend Mount Carmel, you cannot allow yourself to be distracted by the flowers nor frightened by the wild beasts. You have to just go straight up, <laughs> okay? So same general idea. So the other extreme is no matter what sorts of um, uh, bouquets or beasties you may encounter, as you go down, you just keep going down, which in terms of classical dry vipassana would just mean whatever comes up, you just observe, just observe, just observe. That's an extreme. Here's another extreme. You go down to a certain level and you get interested in the content of that level. Usually it's something that involves special powers. And without realizing it, you turn 90 degrees again. And the pernicious part of this is you don't know it. You think you're on a vector to the source, but in fact, you're now going parallel to ordinary experience out into the realms of power, exploring them. And you can spend a lot of time doing that. <clears throat> and as I say, there's actually nothing wrong with exploring those realms unless uh, you think you're still going down. Then that becomes a shunt away from progress. What's in between? So between turning 90 degrees again, right? You're here on the surface, 90 degrees down, and then gradually without realizing it, you turn 90 degrees again, right? Now you're going parallel, but you don't know it. So one extreme is you're only interested in the realms of power. Uh, uh, the Lakota Sioux call those people Pejuta Wichasha, uh, <clears throat> which actually literally is a medicine person or a healer. Then the other extreme is what I mentioned. You, uh, you don't go into those realms at all. You just purify and get insight. In Lakota, that is referred to as a Wichasha Wakan, uh, a sacred person. The spectrum of classical shamanism all over the world, and this is the original religion of our species everywhere. There was a time when everyone, as far as I, anthropologists know, everyone sort of had essentially the same religion, and it was shamanism. This is the old time religion. Judaism, Christianity, Confucianism, what have you, they may be old, but they're not old the way this is old. They're not 10, 20, 30, 40,000 years old, okay. Uh, so the spectrum of classical shamanism ranges through all the oblique angles, from pure power to pure purification. But most shamans that I've ever met are on an intermediate angle. They're definitely gaining no self purification insight. There's a component to that vector of going down, but there's also a component out. Of, and depending on the relative magnitude of your interest in power and the, what the spirits have to say versus the egolessness uh, and oneness and so forth, so that. That's why I speak of the spectrum of classical shamanism. It goes all the way from, and in the power area, you can actually get, um, you can get cultural negatives that are very intense for those cultures. Uh, you get, you can have very dysfunctional cultures. It, I mean, it's not just modern people that are messed up, okay? Uh, there are traditional, you know, uh, cultures uh, um, that uh, have really messed up views of the world. It's not uncommon, for example, to believe that death is not natural. Someone dies, it's because someone killed them. 
and probably killed them with medicine. And by medicine, I mean magic. Shot. So Native, uh, American Indians have an entire vocabulary. It's English, so they can in talk intertribally. But it's English you would never understand. You wouldn't know what it means to shoot medicine at someone or to get engaged in a medicine war with another tribe. That's warfare in the power realms, and they take that absolutely as seriously as warfare on the surface. It's the same deal. Someone dies, you go to the shaman, why did they die? Well, those guys up the river shot medicine at us. And then we got to either shoot arrows at them or shoot medicine back. So it's not necessarily a good thing, okay? It really depends on the culture. Um, I mean, I've, I've had friends that, for whom medicine wars were a serious business. Um, I have to say, I, do, I don't share the paradigm, but I knew it was very real for them. Um, and they were from these kinds of cultures and so forth. So anyway, there's this spectrum uh, that I call the spectrum of classical shamanism. And if, uh, uh, like, um, well, I guess maybe this is going into too much detail. Um, uh, there's a lot of fear in the Navajo culture, for example, of shape, shapeshifters, things like that. So there can be some real negatives around some of this stuff. Uh, okay, so, um, so let me tell you a story, a personal story about shamanism. So um, I, uh, years and years ago, I, uh, decades ago actually, um, I was running a retreat in Tucson. Steve knows what I'm going <laughs> to talk, talk about. Steve knows, the, uh, knows this uh, medicine person. Um, so we were running a retreat at this ranch, Doug Boy's Ranch. And uh, this is nigh under 40 years ago, I think. Uh, so a while back. Um, maybe not that, 35, I guess. Uh, and uh, so... Doug was very into Native American spirituality, but he'd grown up in Korea, actually. His father was, I guess, in the military. So he knew a lot about Asian culture, and he wanted the Buddhist teachers to get together with the uh, Native American teachers. So he said, um, there's a local Tohono O'odham, that's a tribe that uh, anthropologists used to call the Pima Papago, so there's a local Tohono O'odham uh, Indian, uh, his name is Rupert and Sinas. And um, if you want, he'll do a sweat lodge for you, sweat, the sweat lodge ceremony. So um, well, I said, well, what is it? <laughs> Tell me what, you know, after the retreat, we could do this sweat lodge. So it's, well, what's a sweat lodge? Describe it to me. He described it and made sense. I, I could see how it would fit with Buddhist practice. And he said, Rupert is a pipe carrier. He's a roadman in the Native American church, which is the peyote religion, which is the North American version of ayahuasca, basically. Um, and he's a sun dancer. And I said, well, what's a sun dance? And he described that. And it sort of made sense to me. Um, so we had this sweat lodge. And I. <laughs> I remember, so that was my first lodge. And um, so it's, it's out on the res, and there's, there's no technology. Uh, he didn't even have electricity in his house at that time. I mean, now he's got a cell phone and, you know, uh, YouTube segments and things like that. But, you know, things change, right? But back then, he didn't even have electricity. I was, and um, so... Um, Anyway, so I remember um, there was this point where, you know, you open the flap, and he was running it the Lakota way. There's different ways of running a sweat lodge. Uh, he was doing it the Lakota way. So the Lakota, or Eastern Sioux, the uh, person that pours the water sits at the, uh, at the door. 
So he opens the door, all the steam goes out. There is the pristine Sonora Desert without any telephone lines or cars or anything, okay? It looked the way it looked 20,000 years ago. And the sun's coming down and um, uh, it's sort of glancing rays. Uh, he's full blood Indian, just classic, looks like something right out of the Smithsonian Institute. So it's his profile, his long hair, you know, because you unbraid your hair uh, in the ceremony, right? So he's got the long hair and uh, like classic Native American features. And you could see uh, the sun was revealing a chest full of piercing scars mm -hmm. from the sun dance. Like he'd sun danced 16 times at that time. And that was 30, 35 years ago. So, um, and it was like, oh my God, this is a time tunnel that we're being allowed to enter, to experience what our really remote ancestors experienced. And it's like, it was just amazing to me. Uh, and um, when I got out, I remember crawling out. It was pretty hot, hot lodge. And I remember the first thought that went through my mind. Oh, this is what they call, quote, primitive religion. Because shamanism used to be called primitive religion. And the reason for the air quotes is uh, it was so advanced, so subtle, so multi-leveled, so psycho-spiritually sophisticated, weaving group therapy into prayer, into the power realms, into purification through equanimity, into being forced to concentrate because you just can't do anything but concentrate. So it's like, oh, primitive religion. And meaning, of course, that when the Europeans came here, it's true that a, a metal axe is a more advanced tool than a stone axe. But I guess they assumed that because the physical technology was, primi quote, primitive, that the psycho-spiritual life of those people was primitive. And it was, it was the very antithesis of that. Um, so anyway, that was my first encounter with shamanism. And uh, <clears throat> I'll be seeing Rupert again next month when I go to Tucson, 35, however many years later, we're still doing ceremonies together. <laughs>